afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, if you could just take your seats, that would be fantastic. I do hope you enjoyed your lunch and uh, the tour of the, our committee rooms and all the exhibition space within that. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Alex Cole Hamilton. I'm the member of the Scottish Parliament for Edinburgh Western. Can I just see a show of hands? Have I got any constituents in the room? I can see a couple of friendly faces there. Lovely to have you here. I'll obviously direct all of my comments to you for the next <laughs> couple of hours. Um, it's lovely to have you here. And um, thank you so much for bringing your gathering here today. It's important that this space is used um, in the way that you're using it as a, a gathering place, a place for exchange of ideas. But it's also very much a place where politicians such as myself and others present today can hear your views. I think that's absolutely key. I was speaking to Kath and Mary and Eileen just a minute ago about how important it is to, to engage with voters such as yourself because you are voters and you are have a stake in the democratic process and without you uh, none of us would be here and I offer you a reflection it's quite hard for Lib Dems to get elected these days and, and part of how I did that was by knocking 25,000 doors I'll give you one anecdote of just uh, that, that kind of exchange that um that got me here. So when I was a kid, we used to sail a dinghy um, in St Andrews. It was an otter class dinghy. It was a beautiful thing. We loved it very much. Um, but when we uh, grew older, my parents uh, didn't have time to use it and we sold it. Uh, sad, but that's what happens. And, um, and then I was walking through Crammond, which is a coastal village in my constituency in March, and I walked into this driveway. And under this tarpaulin was a boat, and, and sure enough, it was an otter class dinghy. And it was not only that, but I was absolutely convinced it was exactly the same dinghy that my parents had sold 20 years ago. And as it happens, a constituent was just walking out of his house at that time, walking his little dog, yapping at his heels. And I gave him my patter. I'm Alex Cole Hamilton. I'm the Lib Dem running for the Scottish Parliament. But before I go any further, can I ask, is that an otter? And he looked at me and he said, are you quite mad? It's a Jack Russell. <laughs> so I think the, the moral of that story is that really everybody's got a story to tell and it's important to hear them. And that's very much what we're here to do today. Uh, it is my great pleasure um, to be the vice convener of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee. And of course, um, age is a protected characteristic in terms of um, the Equalities Act. And uh, very much a lot of the concluding observations that we as a committee are looking at from various UN rapporteurs are connected to age. And I think that's very much something I would like to explore with you this afternoon. Um, in a minute, I'm going to kind of invite questions about the work of our committee um, in the Equalities and Human Rights Committee. But I'm also very pleased to have David Cullum here, who's our able clerk from uh, the Health Committee, on which I also sit. And he and I um, will take uh, questions and discussions about the work of that committee after this section. Um, I think it's fair to say that uh, we still have some way to go in Scotland to realise full equality, um, not least in terms of uh, age issues, but also around disability, around children's rights, around uh, a whole race, uh, range of race relations and other things, um, not least the disparity in terms of uh, men and women's equality within the workplace, something that I know a lot of people who are facing issues around pensions um, find particularly apposite at the moment. Uh, it's a very exciting committee to be on. It's just had its remit expanded, and particularly at a time when um, the, there is a threat to things like our, um, our sort of the, the basis on which we form rights legislation within Scotland and the United Kingdom is in question, with the Conservative government at Westminster talking about bringing in a British Bill of Rights, uh, it really concentrates minds as to what we need to protect and what we need to do more of in terms of making rights real and equalities real um, for, for each uh, community in our society. So for the next sort of 10 or 15 minutes or so, I'd like to kind of invite your questions about the work of our committee, your own views about equalities, about how we uh, can bridge those gaps that exist in our society. Um, so really, I'd like to hand over to you. And if, if we could go as we did in the first session, um, if you could stand up, if you have a question, if you can stand, um, please do so. If you can't, that's fine as well. But uh, make yourself known to me and wait for the red light to come on after I've um, indicated that I want you to speak. Um, and then if you could give your name and where you're from as well, that would be really helpful. So quite um, keen to hear what you have to say. Lady in the second row, 
Uh, there, please. Good lad. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Marilyn Jones. I'm a member of Scottish Borders Tenants Organisation. And the thing that worries me about benefits and health care is um, senior citizens don't always like to ask for help. Um, but now a lot of housing associations, Scottish Borders Housing Association, um, actually have employed welfare benefits officers um, to help fill in forms, asking um, have they got their own, have they got their rights, you know. But what worries me is what about homeowners that don't have that service? What about private landlords? There's a lot of people out there that don't know where to go or don't even know if they're getting everything they should. I think, Marilyn, I think that's an excellent question. Um, when, when you were speaking there, it just reminded me very much of my, my own mother-in-law. My, my mother-in-law cares for my father-in-law, who has profound MS, has done for 30 years. Um, and it never occurred to me that they weren't getting the help that they needed until she told me um, that that afternoon she'd had to flag down a passing motorist because she, he'd had a fall and she wasn't strong enough to lift him. And I thought, my goodness, I had no idea that they were, you know, there was nothing there to to help them and it was just because she a sort of never felt able to ask she was almost too proud to ask for help and b didn't really know who to ask for that help and i think that's a problem right across our society it's a classless problem as well it, it happens in all um walks of life people you know have worked all of their lives provided for themselves all of their lives and done so with, with great pride and it's very difficult i think to put your hand up and say actually i might be struggling in this particular aspect of my life I think there's a responsibility on elected members, not just, not just parliamentarians, but councillors as well, to make sure that people who come through their surgery um, doors know what rights they're entitled to, what state support they are. But I think there's a job of work as well in our councils to make that clear. I've just come from my surgery, um, working with a, a number of families facing different challenges, all of whom were unaware of the extent of the support that they could be getting from the council. And it was only just from, you know, um, actually sort of steering them towards that. Hopefully they'll be able to access that. It shouldn't be like that, though. It should be readily available. It should be clear on billboards, on, um, in, you know, any, wherever you go for advice, that there are telephone numbers to ring, people to contact, and, and it shouldn't be that difficult. Oh, sorry. Right. right in the front here. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's a, f a follow on comment from what I said earlier this morning. Sorry, could you give us your oh, name? Oh, sorry, Helena Scott, Scottish Mental Health Cooperative and Age in Mind. I want to ha uh, go back onto the equality duty um, on health and social care integration partnerships. <coughs> to me, it's something I just can't let go, I'm afraid, because I'm still not very satisfied with the response I'm receiving. What might be the objective justification? by any integration board to age cap adult social care at 65? And secondly, how do you feel um, cut, um, equality cutting strands, particularly around age and mental health under the disability aspect, are being treated just now? I would exercise a certain degree of um, disappointment that when I look at the way that equality impact assessments are being done, quite honestly, are they really addressing the equality duty that is incumbent in law? Well, well I think the answer is no. Um, and Sorry, could you just give me the second about the, the cutting? Yeah, um, where you might have two equality strands that interface with each other, yeah. such as age and disability. So we might, I could argue, on, a, on an age ground, that to cap adult social care at the age of 65 um, would have to have an object, objective justification for doing that. Yes. It should not be discretionary upon the, any one of the 31 um, partnerships in Scotland. And secondly, um, if I felt that I wasn't getting anywhere there, my approach would be through the disability. Why yes. should people um, experience living with mental illness over 65 not receive the same service as someone younger than them? I, I think that's a, an exceptionally important question and very well made, uh, very well put. Um, I think the state has always struggled with intersectionality, um, whether that's you know, a, a confluence of protected characteristics, which takes supremacy and how we respond to them. And, and indeed, the, uh, the objective justification, as you describe it, I think is 
is a balance that we have still yet to find in, in the way we do it. A lot of it comes down to, you know, local authorities point to resources or lack thereof, and they have to say, look, you know, we have to put the cut off somewhere. But I don't think that that recognises the very human, very personal stories that come along with each and every case that you describe. And I think that your sector, in particular in the mental health sector, um, is one that's lagging far behind. It's still, um, you know, we are just now finally uh, beginning to look at a refreshed mental health strategy after the last one exp um, expired at the end of last year. Um, now, I would want to see exactly those points that you've just articulated covered in that. It is not at the moment uh, within the, the, uh, the reach of that strategy. We're missing a trick. Sorry, did you want to come back in? May I just add one, one further point, which is um, the driver in social care is personalization. That personalisation is about the person-centredness of service access and service delivery. Now, in a sense, why do we have personalisation if we can't address the needs from an individual perspective, irrespective of age? We should not be using age as a proxy to delineate who receives services at what point in their life. Life course was mentioned through some of the participants here today. It should be a transitional stage irrespective of a person's health. It should not be stopped according to um, a certain point in a person's life. I understand that there may be um, resource implications of how you manage services, yeah. which can be better organised maybe by using an age as, as a grouping. But if you look at the transition of young people into adult social care and adult social care into old age psychiatry, it's not seamless. No. Mm -hmm. And my argument very strongly is that we are not addressing the wider needs, mental health needs of people over 65 that are non-dementia. Yeah. And I feel that is a major gap. And I, and I think you're right. And that, uh, that transition age is not keeping pace with the age of retirement. It's uh, across the board. And I think personalization is a word that we politicians like to use quite a lot. It's used in both the health and social care uh, worlds, or those, those worlds are absolutely colliding right now, um, but we're still not matching reality with rhetoric. So if you talk, think about self-directed support, I'm sure a lot of you are aware of self-directed support. Some of you may even be using self-directed support. Um, it's a fantastic, and as a liberal, I, I find it a, a fantastic idea. You know, it's empowering, gives you the dry, control, as much control as you want to take over the direction of your care. However, if you live in Angus, for example, I, and I come from the, the children's social care workforce. In Angus, there are 104 children who require respite support, um, and Angus were desperate to get them all, all into self-directed support and to start managing their own budget. However, there is one care home in Angus um, which covers all 104 kids. So that's the only care home there will ever be in Angus because there's no business model there for a private provider to come in and set up a rival care home um, because it just won't be the custom. So actually giving parents control of those budgets to commission the service they were getting anyway isn't choice. So this is, these are the symptomatic of the barriers that we're going to have to break down as a society to answer the needs around personalisation. But I think your point is exceptionally well made and thank you for making it. Gentlemen in the middle at the back in the green sweater, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> I think, <clears throat> sorry, I'm Ian Clement. Um, I'll wear my committee councillor and NHS patient hat on this question. Anne is an ex-member of the Christie Commission, which is a terrible tragedy that it was not continued and its use used appropriately, but that's as it is. The problem is that we hear from politicians a lot of aspirational talk. We actually want things done. That's the big gulf. We are actually the people that pay for things. And sometimes this gets rather lost because healthcare integration, it's a great idea. But unless the foundation is secure, what you put in it is not going to hold up. And that's the major problem. It's a great, it's a great thing in the theory, but in practice, it is not working well. The other thing is I was on what's called the Eye Care Integration Strategy Board. That was to make eye care and vision support more readily available to patients and communities. The last meeting was three years ago. I have no idea what's happened to it. There's no support from the government. There's no support from health boards. You have NHS Lothian, patient-focused public involvement. They don't do it. They're not interested.
They don't want the voice of the patient. We are just the awkward squad. And also community councils. We're statutory bodies. I'm a community councillor. Where is the support for community councils? We're just ignored. Yeah. And the other thing basically is that we have the problem now, of course, where a certain party wants to centralise everything and we want to localise. How do you bridge this gap? Because the whole thing is that the, when people start, well, the state is essentially withdrawing from a lot of healthcare and handing it over to private companies. Now, you go back 30 or 40 years, you knew the state was going to be there for you. Now the question is, it seems the state is not going to be there for you, and that is really going as a fundamental change. And it doesn't matter whatever you politicians say, the people will realise you're not there for us. Thank you. Wow. I think... <laughs> Well, firstly, sir, I didn't catch your name there. Ian, sir. Ian sorry. Um, Ian, well, firstly, can I thank you for your service, both on the Christie Commission, which I think was an exceptional body of work, and I agree with you, is, is sadly kind of diminished o over time in terms of the, um, the use that the government has made of it. But also thank you for your service to the Community Council. Um, the Christie Commission, I think, came out with two of the most fundamental sort of recommendations or approaches to public policy and that was first and foremost about prevention and uh, and then secondly by extension reduction of failure demand and the, the prevention side of things has always got my goat about politicians because I've always believed and I can see this I can see the seduction of this being an elected politician myself the politicians rarely see beyond the date of their next election there, there is a, a visceral desire in the political classes to see something pay off within the next four or five years. So you can point to it on a leaflet at election time and say, oh, I did that, you know, we changed that, we improved that. Whereas actually, as you know from your work, Ian, in the Christie Commission, that a lot of the social problems that we face um, across our society um, actually require investment now for a payoff that we may not see for 10, 15, 20 years. And that works in the criminal justice system, it works in the care system, it works in, um, in, the way, in social care and in education, right across the board. And it's the political will that we now to connect up with the work that your commission did um, to, to make that a reality. And that's in a way connected to the second half of your question, which is uh, about subsidiarity. And I, as a liberal, obviously, wholeheartedly endorse what you say about the, the desire to create um, and to move things closer to the people, move power and decision making closer to the people. And I think that there is, I, I won't get party political about this because that's not what this event is about, but there is definitely a shift at the moment towards centralization. We've seen that in the creation of Police Scotland, which is amalgamating um, police boards, and, and I'll let you make your own mind up as to whether that's been a success or not. There is discussion within the uh, uh, the health directorate of the Scottish Government about merging health boards, moving down from 14 health boards, potentially um, just three, and also, um, slightly more controversially, the idea that we could lose 32 local authorities and, and be reduced to, to a size smaller still. I think that's completely the wrong direction of travel. Uh, if you take police the Police Scotland merger, for example, I think that we now see a situation where divisional commanders are facing operational control and applying tactics which work in Glasgow to the streets of Edinburgh. Um, whereas actually the, the range of social problems that we face in Edinburgh is very different. Um, and that's because we've lost that local decision making element to it. And I think that works for community councils. We ignore community councils as parliamentarians at our peril. They are the source of greatest intelligence for us and they are the source of basically my entry. So thank you for doing what you're doing in the community council. I hope you'll continue to do so. I've been told that we um, only have time for one more question on the health, uh, on the Equalities Human Rights Committee. A lady in the green at the back in the middle there. Oh, no, in the mid, no, right, yeah, you, sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Gozi Jo Adigwe of RNIB Scotland. Um, I'd like to thank SOPA for um, inviting RNIB and our entourage of eight along here today. Um, there was a couple of points I wanted to make. I wanted to resonate with the points that Helena made around personalisation and um, the, this cap 
arbitrary cap on uh, uh, services to people over 65. I think if you were to look around the entourage that we, we have today from RNIB, not only are they elderly, which is a commonality with others in the room, um, they're, they're also of ethnic backgrounds and they also have sight loss. So seeing the person is hugely, hugely important to us as a as an organisation. Um, I, I wanted to sort of ask or get some comments with regards to digital technology um, and the digital by default that is very much the policy within the Scottish Government. As a national organisation, we are at the cutting edge of access technology to allow people with visual impairments to, to use the range of technology that's um, available uh, to, to the wider population. However, it has to be noted that this access technology is, comes at great expense and at great cost and therefore in itself can create an inequality of access. I think this is even more important in the devolving of powers to the Scottish Government with the social security, um, uh, particular social security benefits, where we're looking potentially to an approach to put all of the, the, the applications online. I would very much like to hear your perspective from the Equalities and Human Rights Committee um, in terms of making that access equitable. Alongside that, I'd also like to speak about a little bit about poverty. Um, people who have sight loss are more likely um, to, to, to not be in employment, um, to require benefits, and potentially not be able to access those benefits for, for a variety of reasons. Just within the backdrop of that in Scotland, we have huge income inequality anyway. So I'd like you to also yeah. maybe make a recommendation about how we ensure equitable access for everybody across society in Scotland. I love it when you ask for one last question and it's a massive basket of issues. Um, thank you for the question. Uh, beautifully put. Uh, firstly, just touching on, I think, the age of transitions, which we've, we've talked about, that arbitrary cut-off of 65. It's the same at the, um, at the sort of transition into adult services from children's services, arbitrary cut-off at 18. Working, as I have done over years, with kids with profound autism, moving into a very different set of services at the age of 18 arbitrarily, when they're not ready to and not supported to, is a disaster. In the same way, you know, why do we make it 65? Because that used to be the pension age. That's changing too. It, it, needs to be adaptable and flexible to people's needs on an individual basis. Uh, digital inclusion is so inexorably linked to poverty, um, and this came up in a debate in this chamber just last week in the fuel poverty uh, debate that I spoke in, that right now you get the best energy tariffs if you can sign up online. You get the best, um, you can, you get better deals as well if you can uh, arrange direct debits through bank transfers online. Um, there is something called the poverty premium, which I'm sure a lot of people in this room are aware of, that um, if you're in an income-deprived area, if you're in an area of multiple deprivation, you're far more likely to have um, an energy meter that you have to feed with cards to get your electric. Um, that machine can have a voracious appetite when you have very little um, in, in the bank each week. And yet it's far more expensive than if you were able to sign up online for um, a, a smart tariff. In Kirkliston, um, a village just four miles from here, I see one of our residents there, um, we still don't have broadband speeds above two meg. Um, this, is, uh, this is our nation's capital, and we don't have digital inclusion. That's far worse, as, if you, as Gozi absolutely rightly says, you can't afford the um, infrastructure, the, the terminal or the PC, to get you online in the first place. You have to go to your library. You have to make sure that there's a machine that's free and working. This is not, you know, there is an amazing world of opportunity with the, the internet and everything around it brings, but we are leaving people behind and we're forgetting about them. And I think I speak, I hope I speak for everyone when I say that the constituency of people worst affected are those um, in the older generations. I. I I, uh, somebody once said that, you know, my kids are natives to the ICT world. Well, I'm an immigrant to it because I, I remember a time before the internet and I've had to learn it. I know you all have had to learn it. But there are those of us in, you know, particularly socially, it, that lack of digital inclusion walks hand in hand with social isolation. And that has to be one of the foremost challenges that we address as a parliament and as a public body. And I, I know that you're working very hard on that as well. 
I think right now, if it's okay, I, time is a pace, so I'd like to introduce David Cullum, who is our very excellent clerk to the Health Committee. I, it is a pleasure for me to serve on that committee with David. He keeps us right. He can be very strict. That's necessary for me. Um, so David, do you, if you want to come up and talk about the Health Committee, and then he and I will answer your questions about that work. Thank you. Thank you, and you can guess how difficult it is to keep the committee in line. Um, okay, um, good afternoon, and welcome again uh, to the Scottish Parliament. I'll be brief, because this session is about hearing your views, opinions, and suggestions. Um, as Alex said, I'm clerk to the Health and Sport Committee. The members of that committee would ask me to apologise, um, because nobody was here to deliver this session to you. I know Alex is now here and uh, we're I'm, del I'm especially delighted to have him because it takes a little bit of the onus on me. Um, I chased and chased and chased the members to try and get somebody to come. Friday is a constituency day for members. They're down here Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. They're not all local. I got a fantastic range of um, excuses or reasons why they couldn't be here. It's a brilliant, it's a case study on what MSPs do on a Friday. I'm not going to go through them, but uh, believe me, it was, some of them were very creative. Anyway, so you've got good, you've got me. Um, there's a good element to that. It may be that I won't talk as much. Um, now, I know you heard from the convener of the committee this morning, Neil Finlay. Um, I'm not going to repeat what he said, but I want to elaborate just before I pass it to you on a couple of areas. Um, Neil gave some detail about work the committee are undertaking in general. Um, can I just talk a little bit about the role of the committee in the Parliament? And this applies to all the committees, uh, I think. The committee's principal role is to hold the government and the other public bodies to account for what they do, their policies, their spending, um, and, and that sort of thing. The committee, in exercising that, is really exercising influence. Uh, and that's quite important when it comes to thinking about your questions and how we're, we're probably going to answer them. And the, this committee is very keen to hold people to account for what they do and what they achieve. Now, the real m reason I mention what the committee is about is to say what the committee doesn't do. And they do not deliver services themselves. Um, and I guess when you're making your comments, it's don't blame us, Gov, it's not our fault. The KPNT would say they are doing their best uh, and they're working pretty hard. Now, lastly, I, I want to mention the committee's strategic plan. Um, Neil mentioned um, that this morning and the aim that which is set out in the strategic plan is in your programme. Actually, when the committee agreed the strategic plan, they're the first committee ever in the Scottish Parliament to agree a strategic plan, which was good, it's good. But I got a couple of emails and phone calls from people saying, well, where is it? And I said, it's online. And they said, well, we've seen it, and that's it. That's it, the entire strategic plan. Where's the rest of it? Um, and I guess the rationale for that is if you look at many businesses' strategic plans, it runs to 30 or 40 pages. This doesn't, it's short, it's concise. It, um, it says exactly what the committee are doing. Um, I'm just going to quickly just talk a little bit about it. Uh, the overriding aim the committee has set itself is to improve the health of the people of Scotland. In all its actions, that is what they're aiming to do, improve the health of the people of Scotland. Um, I guess everybody working in health would, would share that aim. Um, at least we sincerely hope they do. The strategic plan then goes on to set out four principles that the committee will use and is using to test all activity that they undertake to scrutinise against. So four principles, the impact a policy, a practice, a service is having on health inequality. The committee are keen and are pushing people to answer that question. The extent to which activity has a prevention focus. We've got quite close to talking about prevention. We've been alluding to um, some of the Christie principles. Prevention is key. And that's what drives the question that you were asked to consider for this afternoon. 
The committee are interested in the long-term cost effectiveness and efficiency of activity that's taking place. I have to say, as a clerk, I, I've sat in committees for a number of years now, and I hear so many people talking about how effective they are, but it has to be coupled with efficiency. And the committee are lumping the two together. And finally, it's no getting away from it in this place at the moment. The implications of the UK's EU exit um, is a matter of interest to the committee, uh, and it, that will grow. Um, the focus of the committee is on outcomes achieved, outcomes being proposed. And they want to hear how activity adds value. And they want proof of that. There's no point people coming into this committee and saying, we're adding value. They'll just say, how? Prove it. Give us some examples. And that will continue throughout the next four or five years, I'm sure. The strategic plan also makes clear the committee's desire. Actually, it's a demand um, that they make on the clerks that we're inclusive of all sections of Scottish society. The committee wants to be accessible. It wants to get the views of service users. Less interested in those at the top end of organisations who are running them. They want service users, those that are receiving um, services, to speak to the committee. Essentially, that's why we're here today. That's why you've got that question. This was seen as a golden opportunity to hear from a large number of service users. Can I say that in giving your views and thoughts today, please look on it as giving evidence to the committee. It may not be directly in relation to a particular piece of work, but we will store it up, we will use it. We will consider it as evidence that the committee has heard. Evidence has different connotations in here to that in the courts. This place here is lots and lots of um, so-called evidence, which is generally, as I say to the committee, biased opinion designed to influence. That's fine, we know it's that. We want to hear your opinion. We want you to influence the committee. Yeah, some of you will be biased, but what the heck, nobody, everybody else is in a way. Okay, that's enough for me. You were invited to consider what preventative activity could assist in reducing ill health and health equalities. What we would like, I think, what would be really helpful are examples of good practice. Um, can I now invite your views? Can I ask you to raise your hands? Alex will identify you. Um, a couple of please. Please identify yourself. And please, please, can you keep it brief? That way we can hear from a lot more people. Do you want to come in, Yes, thank you. Okay, I see quite a few hands here. So I, I see the lady to the right, yes, in the, in the blue cardigan, in the red shirt. It will come on automatically. Yeah, there you go. Okay, I, hey, my name's Diana Quigley, and I'm an individual, as we all are. Did you move the microphone? Yes, certainly. As we all are, I'm an individual. It's just a comment. In our local sports centre, the doctors are recommending people go and get exercise, and they send them there. And the number of people whose faces fall, and they realise they've got to pay seven pound for this particular course, or six pound. It's maybe not a lot to some people, but to some people it could be a meal for that week. I don't know what you can do about that. So uh, we are, <coughs> David has just whispered in my ear that the Health Committee is actually launching a, uh, an inquiry into this next year. And this, I think, speaks to that discussion we had earlier about the poverty premium. Um, not necessarily that people who struggle with the seven pounds are in poverty, but they are close to. And I think it's also the fact that um, in our most deprived communities, uh, they are often those which are least uh, have least access to fresh vegetables and produce with which to prepare healthy meals. You know, why is it that in our more deprived communities you can only find in Iceland, whereas actually, it, it, if you're in Stockbridge or Morningside, you've got um, farmers markets and, and the rest of it that there's an, an inequality there and I think that we actually do ourselves as a society a disservice by not recognizing the prevention aspect of investing in access to physical activity if, if we as the state were to pick up your seven pound tab for your exercise then actually we're probably going to be saving ourselves money down the line in terms of things that we've managed to stop or stopped you getting ill or, or kept you weller for longer, all of which have an exponential difference in terms of the cost that the state eventually uh, meets out. And that's all about prevention. Good question. Thank you. 
gentleman here in the tie. Yeah, Jan de Vries again from Youth EA and East Kilbride. Um, I was just talking to Donald McLeod there uh, during the break, um, and I was saying to him that uh, something that's been happening to is getting closer to home, that there were quite a few um, people I know <coughs> have been falling recently of our age. And one thing I, I didn't know, that there, are, there are some preventive courses apparently about how uh, you'd stop yourself falling. So perhaps that's something that could be introduced or made more publicly aware. I wasn't aware that such things are, are available. That's the prevention of falling for elderly people to watch how you right, get up. So, so maybe that's a suggestion. Yeah. The, the, a number of nurse practitioners have been trained in, in exactly that. And I think it's very important. Falls are a, a horrendous drain on we have the mic back on? Each of the people I've been talking about, there are three in particular in the last month, they've each broken a limb, yeah. a clavicle, uh, 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 an arm, and, and, uh, and, the, uh, and a wrist. So we're talking about breaking of bones. Falls are the number one uh, cause of hospital admissions in the over 65s. And in, in, a vast, in, in a large number of those cases, they don't actually lead to broken bones, but people are still admitted. There is still... Um, that is just what happens. You, um, largely 999 calls, are, uh, 999 is dialed, people are taken to hospital and then they stay there. And that leads to a set of circumstances which are also negative. So for example, I had a constituent, and I raised this with the First Minister a couple of weeks ago, I had a constituent who had a fall in March. Um, he didn't break any bones, but was admitted to the Liberton Hospital. Um, he caught a small infection in the hospital, but was, fi was found fit to go home in June. However, because he was 83 and was still a bit frail, um, it was f felt he needed a care package. It was the failure to install that care package, which meant that he spent his 150th night in Liberton Hospital after being declared fit to go home uh, last week. And that's the kind of delayed discharge, which costs tens of thousands of pounds, which prevents other people from accessing that resource uh, and the rest of it. But yes, I, I think you're absolutely right. If we can do things that um, empower people within their own homes to take basic exercise or um, techniques which can avoid falls or adaptations to homes which are easier to come by, um, then, then we, we save a lot of grief, absolutely. Goodness. Mr. Derek Young at the very back there. Thank you. Um, and can I be the second person to mention Kurt Liston in the parliamentary chamber? That may be the first time that's ever happened. Um, we I'm heard sure in the morning it. session, sorry, I'm Derek Young, the senior policy officer with Age Scotland. We heard in the morning session, Alex, when you weren't here, uh, about loneliness repeatedly. And I know that was something that the Equal, um, Equalities and Human Rights Committee's predecessor in the previous session held an inquiry into. It was actually a groundbreaking inquiry, the first ever in the world, as far as we know, to look at the issue of loneliness. I would encourage, though, the Health and Sport Committee to pay attention to this in the, the rest of this parliamentary session, because what was revealed is that loneliness is an issue that doesn't specifically or exclusively apply just to age. It can apply to any age. So the equalities issue isn't actually the main focus. What we do know, though, is the profound impact that it has on people's health and well-being. It's, it's a social determinant of health, but it's not often looked in that way as the way as income or educational status, poverty, poor housing are. Um, but we know that it doubles your risk of developing dementia if you have chronic loneliness. It is as bad as you as a 15 a day smoking habit, and it increases by 10% your risk of mortality. It is something that is, has a huge profound effect on the way people live and the resources they have to draw upon if they need that support from the health service. So living up to the ideal of prevention, this is something that could deserve attention. The Scottish Government is consulting on a strategy next year, and I would like to see the Health and Sport Committee look at that either during or after that process. That, that point is exceptionally well made. I should say that I mentioned Kirk Liston in First Minister's questions yesterday, so it's not the, the only time it's been mentioned. But no, the loneliness strategy has to be front and centre in the work not just of my committee um, in the Equalities and Human Rights Committee. I, I should say that our convener, Christina McKelvey, um, would be here today, but for family issues she's unable to and she sends her best regards. But that has to be front and centre in our work programme, as it does, and I mentioned intersectionality earlier, but it has to be cross-cutting right across the committees of this parliament because actually in every in literally every devolved area there is an aspect of this um 
through policy, through transport, through even through justice, there are elements of uh, the, that strategy which will have uh, will permeate. So I think it's a, a point that we we do well to remember, and and I know certainly I'll be agitating for that to be part of our agenda. Uh, lady, just in the middle there. Yes. Yes, that's it. Um, Oh, sorry. Okay. It was actually the lady in the black top just in front of you there, but I'll come to you after. Sorry. Yes. Thank you. Yes. It's Harriet Campbell. We heard this morning from um, Neil from the Health and Sports Committee that retain, recruitment and retention in the NHS, something like this has been spoken about for years. What will the committee do about it or what can they do? Because due to shortage of staff in the NHS, that's why we're having all these <coughs> problems. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, you said the magic words, uh, recruitment and retention. I think we actually face an existential crisis in our health service, uh, bigger than anything we've, uh, that's ever come before. If you look, um, the Royal College of GPs tells us that by the end of the decade, we will be 800 fewer GPs than we require as a nation uh, to sustain our primary care services. Um, every sort of aspect of the healthcare service, including uh, um, pediatricians, psychologists, midwives, nurses are coming, beating a path to my door and the doors of the other committee members to say, we aren't training enough people. People are not coming on stream fast enough. That, that problem is vastly accelerated um, with Brexit potentially, because if we cut off um, recruitment from uh, Europe, if we, we stop uh, European migration into uh, the workforce, then we, we close off a tap, of a very important tap in terms of recruitment and retention in the NHS. And without that workforce planning, um, we, we are in real difficulty. Audit Scotland produced a report last week, um, which was quite scathing about where we are as a nation in terms of the health force. And it pointed out that we do our um, workforce plans every five years but it takes seven years to train a doctor. So, you know, that, that's an immediate disconnect which we should resolve. We should be looking not now, not just for the next five years, but for the next 15, 20 years about what will the workforce look like, particularly considering we are on the precipice of a massive uh, generational time bomb where the aging demographic is going to put an exponentially difficult demand on the health service. So workforce planning is, is key to that. So there was a lady behind you I promised to take next in, in the red cardigan. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sorry to have to ask this question again, but I did ask it this morning of Neil Findlay and he didn't answer it. Um, <laughs> so I'm looking at your um, display up there, how to overcome isolation and to improve uptake through more personalised and attractive support services. Well, in fact, the, um, the home care service has been cut in the last year um, the time has been halved for support to my husband who had a stroke um, 10 years ago. He, he only has it in the morning, but it's very valuable and the workers are fine, but the admin is not. And the, the question I asked this morning is, what are you going to do about the illegal it, um, contravention of the European Working Time Directive where the, the care workers only get 10 hours between shifts instead of 11 consecutive hours, which they should do, because this is, you know, it's not okay. Um, and uh, time off in the middle of the day doesn't actually compensate for it at all. Um, and so I've asked this question yeah. several times uh, locally. I'd like to know what the pattern is in the rest of Scotland. And I'm sure there are other shift work patterns that might serve the same purpose. And when you look at in, in overcoming isolation. For some people alone, living alone, the visit of the care worker is the only human being they see in the whole day. So it's really important to make sure that those workers are properly supported and not exploited. Thank you. Um, 
Well, obviously, I'm feeling on the spot that you didn't have that answered earlier. And there's quite a few things to unpack there, but um, I'll do my best. We, as a committee, met with um, some care providers or, or care workers earlier in this session. I think it was one of the most moving um, sessions that any of our committee members had experienced before, hearing the first-hand testimony of people who are up against it, you know, not getting the wages they should be, being asked to uh, perform... Uh, intensely personal services for people uh, to offer compassion, support, uh, friendship, um, physical assistance, um, and yet being paid less than they would if they did a nine to five shelf stacking job in Tesco. Uh, I think that's an indictment of our system. I think it's, uh, it's something that we have written as a committee to the Cabinet Secretary for Health about, and it's something that because of that testimony, we will not um, leave wanting. Um, for the rest of this session. We will work on uh, repeatedly. Did you want to come in, David? Can, can, I, can I just add, can I just add in relation to that? Um, can we have David on the mic? Or maybe you did. Not as uh, can, I, can I just add in relation to the letter the committee wrote? I, I gave a copy of that letter to my mother's carer uh, and she phoned me up the next day and said she was moved to tears that at last somebody was taking notice of their position. We are awaiting the response. I think it's due in the next week. Uh, and in line with all other exchanges with the government, if the committee are not satisfied with the response, they will follow it up. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> so quite a few hands here. I did see um, yourself in the pink cardigan. Is it Elaine? Eileen. Eileen, almost. I'm going to get a bid in here. My name's Wallace, Eileen Wallace, and I'm from Stirling. I appreciate, and like Jean, I'm, I actually lost a couple of dear friends in the last year from falls that happened at home. Could I maybe suggest, and you're going about the long term with health and sport, that we have care standards. Why don't you look at falls standards in that situation? And again, there was terrific work done in Fife. There was work done in Perth and that sort of thing. It's actually been disseminated. The other thing, the other side to take it from as um, a retired ex-professional myself, I know how important call handlers or, or nurse advisors on the end of a line who get a call from a relative or from the person themselves on the floor, and there's nothing they can do about that scenario if there isn't actually a break or a fall. It's very distressing, and they need support as well. So can I actually just say to you, have you ever thought about falls standards? Thank you. Again, I, I think you know, I, the statistics speak for themselves on that. I think it, it has to be... Um, the front and centre. So thank you for that. No, and, and we'll take that into the committee. Just one. Okay. I'm, I'm told we're only allowed one more question. I'm so, sorry, I can see a load of hands up. And can I take the gentleman on the end here? Uh, Rob Snodgrass from Grey Matters in Helensborough. Um, our group believes, and I'd be very surprised if you disagreed, that it's very important for health to keep older people mentally active, to give them a reason to get up in the morning. But when I look at funding for um, active citizenship, I found over 20 funds be between EU, Westminster, Holyrood, all aimed at 16 to 25 year olds. Don't we matter? I mean, don't they want our 40 years of experience? You know, it's not a good time to ask for more money, but maybe a readjustment of how it's distributed would help here. Uh, again, how can you argue with that? Um, no, I, it is, it's, it's absolutely right. I mean, there is a preeminence attached to um, young people. I think that for years and years and years, rightly or wrongly, uh, politicians and other stakeholders within public policy have focused resources towards those people who haven't transited um, into the workforce yet or are struggling to get into the workforce, the 16 to 25 year olds you describe. I think that there is a rationale to that that they would de describe to you that, you know, because we have an aging population that will require to be supported, um, we need th that generation earning and contributing 
Um, otherwise, we can't support that older generation. It doesn't mean it's right. It doesn't mean that focus is right. And one of the reasons I was so pleased to come take the opportunity to chair this discussion this afternoon is because I don't think I hear enough um, from older people. I think, as we discussed in the very first question, older people are less likely to put their hand up and, and tell you um, and ask for help or uh, to say they're not quite coping. And, and I don't think that's right. I think that um, we need to reshift that balance of focus. But this is about lo local democracy as well. I think this is about making your voice heard by approaching your local parliamentarians, your community councils, your health boards, and uh, those who make the decisions about you, and tell them that that you require, uh, what your needs are, what your interests are, and, and exert your stake at that table. Because without that, um, then it, people are, are not going to offer it to you I, and for the reasons you described, sir. I think I will take one more question. <laughs> okay. Lady in the middle at the back from my constituency. Hello again. Well, I think we've met before. Oh, sorry. sorry, that was just quite a short one. Sorry. Yep. Sorry. Well, my name's Marion Mitchell. We have met before. Um, my question is actually... Um, Going back to falls, and I know that uh, the council, every council, I think, provides a service where there's a little wristband which you press the button. If you've fallen and you can't get off the floor, um, then someone will come to your aid. But the problem is, in Edinburgh, they charge you £8 a week. West Lothian, they charge you £1 a week. Neither is means tested. So why is there this discrepancy? Eight pounds a week for some households is actually, or pensioners, is especially yeah. single women, would be um, a lot of money. Well, I described at the start um, my, the situation with my mother and father-in-law, and they um, engaged that service in their council, which is middle in their own Dalkeith, and um, actually stopped it after a while because it was costing them too much money. Um, We've kind of urged, got them to reconsider that, um, but it shouldn't be a, a consideration you have to make. It should just be an entitlement. I think that's where, you know, having a strategy around falls and if, as you describe, um, Eileen, would would actually see that front and centre. We have amazing technology now in the health and social care field. You're probably aware of something called telecare, which is um, is part of what you described. That's just um, just one feature of it. There are many other very sophisticated techniques. There are, there are some sheltered living complexes which use telecare, where they actually have pressure sensors on the floors so that they can detect if a resident hasn't been up uh, and walking for a number of hours or uh, during daylight hours, or has. Uh, or if there is a weight, you know, motionless in a certain part of the property, and that will flag an alarm after a certain period of time, so that they can A, check if somebody can't get out of bed, or B, if they've had a fall. And I think these are not particularly expensive adaptations, but with our ageing population, will have to become a feature of modern life for, for Scottish residents. Um, but I think, you know, given the statistics we've already discussed, the, the pressure on the health service and the social care force, it, it's not, can we afford to do it, but can we afford not to? And those who did, I'm, I'm going to read this note out and just see if I can decipher David's handwriting. Those who didn't get to contribute um, should write to David, my colleague from the Health Committee, David Cullum at the Scottish Parliament. Um, and you can go through the website. If you go to the, the committee pages, you'll find David and his contact details there. Please do feed them in. As he um, articulated very well, we will regard it as evidence uh, for the committee that will fold into our continuing work in, in the fields that we're discussing. And I'd just like to take this opportunity for thank you for being so welcoming to me and, uh, and so um, forthright with your views. So thank you very much. And I'm, I'm now going to pass over to uh, Tom Burney again, who I think is going to uh, conclude this afternoon. Thank you. Uh, uh, thanks, Chair. Um, really, we're now just in the final stage, and uh, we'll be winding up shortly. But before I do, I could ask you, you've all been given an evaluation form. Um, so I could ask you all to, maybe while I'm speaking just now, to start filling it in. It's some, it's, from, it's some pretty simple questions, and we'd like you to, basically what we'd like is you to tell us what you liked, what you didn't like, so that we can do it better next time. Um, I'd like to thank, lots of people have got to thank this kind of organ at the 
event, rather. This kind of event takes a lot of organising, and so I'd like to thank some of the people who did that. Um, particularly, of course, the Scottish Government for the support that they've given us throughout the year, the Equalities Unit of the Scottish Government for putting us on their committees and so on, the Scottish Parliament Events Team, who you've probably seen around here, leading you from room to room and helping with the catering and so on. Thanks to all of them. Uh, thanks to Neil Finlay, Jean Freeman, John McCormick, Alec Cole Hamilton and David Collum for the contributions that they've made. Thanks for that. Thanks to all the people who volunteered to help us today in SOPA, um, among them uh, Rosa McAlpine, Gordon Fraser, uh, Al uh, Alison Gildia, and all of the people who manned exhibition stands. Um, and of course, all of the speakers along the front here who gave us, I thought, very interesting reports of the kind of activities that they were involved in throughout the year. And thanks to all of you for asking your questions, and even the ones who just came and didn't ask questions, thanks for being here anyway, and I hope we've all learned something from it. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the day. Um, one thing you should know is that you're all film stars now, because all of this is being recorded, and we will be looking at the recording, and we'll be taking points that have been made from the floor and from the top table, and we'll be using those to form SOPA's agenda of activity for the next year. So everything said today is recorded. We will be looking back to see what we can do to progress those ideas. Um, in the meantime, have a look at the SOPA website. Um, everything we do, we're a very open organisation. Everything we do is on the website, minutes of our meetings, notes of our meetings, and that type of thing. It's all there. Anything we're doing, look at the website, you can get it. We also produce a regular newsletter. Again, from the website, you can send us an email, and we will put you on the mailing list, and you'll get a copy of our newsletter. We do it by email, so it doesn't cost us anything, but it means that we can send out as many as we want to. So anybody would like to see, receive a regular copy of the newsletter, ask for it, and we'll arrange to get you one. Um, so I always think, though, that in these events... Um, if I can get back, I can get going. Big mistake, always trying to use technology, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd be clever and use my iPad. You know, in a minute, right. Oh, come on, come on, come on, come on, right. Right, oh, <laughs> I'll get it in a minute, I'll get it in a minute. Oh. Right. Uh, I think you've had it with the poem. But anyway, right, so I was going to finish with a poem, but I can't find it. Basically, though, I believe that um, old age is a... Uh, a benefit to the community. We are the glue that holds society together. We keep families together. Family, countries with older people have less crime. Um, we contribute something like 42% of all the voluntary work done in Scotland is done by older people, and a lot of you are here today. So what I will say there is keep up the good work and have a safe journey home. Thanks for coming.